Hello, everybody. Welcome. Come on in. We are here to talk about grad studies from the grad studies office themselves <laughs> and as well as a student. So you can get an idea about what the student experience is like as well. Uh, this is strictly just a Q&A session. So really to start to prompt some questions, I want you guys to make sure that you're putting your questions in the Q&A function um, in, uh, in Zoom here. But this is going to be, again, like I said, recorded so that you can watch it if you're missing anything. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our wonderful title slides so you can see our faces. Yay. Okay, let's see here. So let's just start with introductions. Uh, my name is Molly Pettengill. I'm the Associate Director for Graduate Recruitment, and I also hold my MFA in painting. Um, and with me alongside is my coworker, Melanie. Melanie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Melanie Patterson. I'm Assistant Director of Admissions, Outreach, and Communication. Um, I'm also an alum from RISD. I graduated from the Illustration Department, um, the Undergraduate Department, in 2014. Awesome. And pass it on to Grad Studies Office. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Amy. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Amy Horshock, Director of Graduate Studies, and I'll turn it over to Caroline. Hey, everyone. Caroline Vasquez, Associate Director for Graduate Studies, where I focus on graduate community and the graduate experience. Um, and with us today is Haroon. Do you want to introduce yourself, Haroon? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Haroon. I am a thesis year lab student in the Industrial Design Department. My uh, background is in mechanical engineering and from Pakistan. Yeah, you know what? You're right. And we're having some issues hearing you. If there's a way you can um, pump up your volume or speak closer to your um, speaker. Is it better? Maybe, maybe just speak a little louder. That might help. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, um, Amy, why don't we just start with you and talk a little bit about what your um, what your office does, um, and how you support graduate students? And Caroline, feel free to chime in um, as a group. What you guys do here? Great. So, thanks, Molly. Uh, so what Caroline and I do in the Office of Graduate Studies is work with all of the graduate programs and graduate students across all the different disciplines. So while when you arrive at RISD, you'll have, uh, you know, great knowledge of your own particular grad program, your peers and cohort in the grad program and your faculty, we make sure that um, everything is integrated. So people have an understanding of what's going on across the campus in the grad realm, work with other faculty. I work very closely with faculty on a variety of curriculum type issues. And Caroline and I work together on um, opportunities that are available to all graduate students, again, outside of particular programs. So it could be grad grants or funding to attend conferences and exhibitions or teaching opportunities variety of things like that. And then Caroline focuses uh, specifically um, on the graduate community as well. So co-curricular and extracurricular programming. And if Caroline, you would like to say a few things. Sure. As Amy said, um, my role is to focus on graduate community and the graduate experience. And what that means is um, I run graduate orientation and also programming throughout the year to bring the graduate community together, um, meaning students from all different programs so that you have a chance to interact and share and collaborate with one another. Um, additionally, we serve as sort of your, your central command center for all things graduate study and graduate experience, uh, meaning if you have an issue you need help navigating, either on a personal level or an academic level, you can always come to us and Amy and I will help you um, connect with the right people on campus or off campus, uh, get you to the right office, get you the right supports, and really help you um, make the most of your time here at RISD. Yep, and I just put in the chat just a couple um, options for questions like, uh, 
the kinds of opportunities that we have here, um, questions about where to live, how to get around, what is Providence like? <laughs> the spaces that we have on campus, are they all in one building? No. Um, and what that kind of commuting from one building to the next looks like. It's not like New York City, it's not like Boston. We're like a, a small town city, right? <laughs> um, and of course, uh, the studios and the shops, et cetera, which Sharon, I'm sure you can uh, speak to that. Um, so yeah, I really encourage you guys to put your questions in the Q&A. We are here for you um, for the next hour here. Um, so Haroon, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but what is your educational background? Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering. Okay. I did my undergrad back in Pakistan, worked for a couple of years before I started coming back to Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And Melanie, you got some questions? I think you're muted. I am muted. Um. So, sorry, I am looking, okay. Um, so it looks like um, we have some questions about some campus resources. Um, uh, Harun, do you wanna talk about um, anything that you've used that's been um, important to your time at RISD so far? Uh, I believe like, Career Center is one of them that I use very frequently. I've used very recently as well. Like I went, like recently we had an event called Portfolio Reviews where a lot of different companies come to the career fair. We talk with them for 15, 20 minutes. They review our portfolio. And then the spring, we also have Internship Connect where companies are looking for interns for summers. So before that event, I went to Career Center. They usually do two types of appointments, like walk-ins or uh, like uh, longer appointments. So I did a resume feedback and portfolio review with the Career Center before diving in for the companies in real. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just so putting in a link right now to um, the time and date. Oh, excuse me, of this session, and then I'm just gonna give you the direct link to register for that event. Um, it is being hosted by Kevin Jankowski, the director of the Career Center. Um, and then one of the things that I would say about the Career Center is that um, companies, organizations, nonprofits um, from all over the world, mainly the US, they come to us to find RISD students um, for many reasons. One of them is because they've already hired from us. Um, and so we have a reputation, right? And then the other piece is that our alumni go out when they create their own companies and now they wanna come back and recruit RISD students, right? So that's the other perk of that, but they are just a wealth of knowledge. They have so many connections, whether it be the Harvard Business School, taking courses over the summer there, um, the Meharam Fellowship, there's just so much to learn. So I really encourage you guys um, to go ahead and register for that event. And I'll just add too that your support from the RISD Career Center begins, you know, your once you're enrolled and it continues basically your entire life, right? As an alum, you can access their services and their support, whether that's resume writing, resume editing, job search, all of that support is available to you as an alum as well. Yep. And we have our first question coming in. So I'd like to have more information about where to live. And if as a graduate student, we're gonna have to find if we are going to have our own studios, if not, which majors get them, which majors don't. Um, Caroline or Amy, do you guys wanna answer that question? Yeah, sure, about the studios. Um, it all, well, except for, and correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, except for the liberal arts graduate programs, all graduate students have a studio of some sort, and those take various forms. So in some of the fine arts programs, you have a studio that's your own enclosed space with a key. In other areas, it's more of an open floor plan with a space dedicated just for your work. Um, in graphic design, say it's more of an open plan type mm -hmm. area. So it's a, a working area. So it, it does depend on your specific degree. But it, again, with the exception of the liberal arts programs, everyone has some sort of 
workspace or studio. And I would also say for like teaching, learning and art and design, um, there are some programs that are more collaborative in nature, like interior architecture, whereas something like painting or ceramics, you're sort of more um, isolated in the work that you're doing independently. So it really does depend on the program and the space. But um, I'm going to actually put a link to the campus map. I mean, so one block in Providence is probably the quarter of the size of one block in New York. So <laughs> nothing is really that far away. Um, and I did, the first part of this question was about where to live. Okay. So let's talk about that. I did put a link to housing, which is an amazing resource for on-campus or um, off-campus housing. But Haroon, maybe at, you know, as a student coming from um, uh, outside of the US, how did you navigate that? I think uh, one of the most key resources would be talking to students in your department, like uh, who are currently enrolled, like first year, second year graduate students. Uh, they are helpful in a way that they can uh, either tell you what places, what are the you know neighborhoods where you can uh, be in the walkable distances or you have some sort of bus access. RISD Rides is another resource that you want, want to have a look before you finalize your residence. So that, and then uh, if you if you know people here, they can also have a look to that space for you. So you don't have to finalize before even looking at the space. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. I would say uh, there is also on Facebook, there are different groups for Brown, uh, for RISD Brown, and then there are other student resources, but like if you search for Providence student housing, you'll find a lot of different Facebook groups where people are posting for sublettings or uh, sublease. Uh, I would recommend like if you are not sure of the space, like don't sign a lease and like sublet on someone else's lease before. And then that's a, a good way to not be bound for a longer time. Yeah, we have our own council here at RISD, right? And we do have advocates here at RISD. And so in the housing space, um, residential life is what we call it. Um, they are very, very helpful for international students that can't visit or don't have the means to come visit to see a space. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, do you have any sessions over the summer? Or I know we do some stuff um, in sort of March after students are admitted when they're really starting to commit to look first places to live. Do you do, do you provide any resources um, through grads just with other grads? Right, so um, once you're in, you know, decided to come to RISD um, in the early uh, summer months, uh, Grad Studies provides um, online orientation beginning around June. Um, Haroon is one of our graduate assistants and he has assisted with that process in previous years. Um, so we work with our graduate assistants and orientation guides to um, do webinars every few weeks about topics like housing and getting to Providence and acclimating to life in Providence. Um, and during those sessions, oftentimes we'll have folks from student affairs and residence life come and speak um, on those topics as well. Um, once you're enrolled, you do have access to our private graduate uh, Facebook group where um, some years we have had different, you know, housing exchange type setups with different spreadsheets going on where folks can enter what they're looking for and kind of match themselves uh, mm -hmm. with another student. We have a lot of um, second year students who will post that they're looking for a new roommate in the summer months, those sorts of things. So, you know, as soon as you um, commit to being part of the grad community, we welcome you with open arms and we really, um, um, try to get you acclimated and, and integrated into the community as soon as possible. Yeah. I mean, the beauty about springtime is that people are graduating and now these, these first year students need roommates <laughs> to pay rent, right? So it just makes sense to connect with your department as well. Um, if you're wondering about just sort of what the space looks like, is it bikeable, walkable? Can I have a car? All of those sorts of things are very much tied into housing and where housing is located in 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 Providence um in and around Providence too you know um I did post a campus tour just so you can get a sense of like what on campus looks like and I will say that um you know the closer you are to downtown Providence it gets more expensive the further away out it gets a little bit less expensive but I will also say we are nowhere near New York or Boston 
in that range. Um, we have yeah. about eight major colleges in this area. Um, so, you know, that does make it a little bit competitive, but there's no shortage of housing either. Well, I, I used to be able to say that now, maybe not. <laughs> And I would also like uh, to I was saying, yeah. I'd also like to reiterate that as you're looking for things, and um Haroon may have touched on this, there is a bus system uh called RIPTA, R-I-P-T-A. Again, it's not like uh New York City subway infrastructure, but you know, if you at least if you find housing along one of those lines, that can be really helpful. And you have free um bus passes with your RISD ID. So you can uh, ride the bus for free. So that would be something to look at too, is just, you know, see if you're on a bus route. I would always um, Google map walking, you know, biking, public transportation from where you're looking at to uh, the RISD campus as well, because that can really help you. Um, yeah, and just give a visual of like what the housing options are like there's a lot of um multifamily homes in the immediate area um so these are usually like you know it's like three stories um where some of them are like owner occupied kind of things uh there are some sort of like apartment buildings kind of like brick buildings nearby um if you go further out there are loft apartments available um single family homes that you can rent um and yeah just full gamut of options mm -hmm. And I just put in a link to RIPTA so you can see those routes there, which is free. Um, the second thing that we also have at RISD because we are a small private school um, is RISD rides. And so I just put up the link to the transportation. And this is an amazing resource, not just for the convenience, but for the safety of our students too. Um, you know, it, you can be working all hours of the night if that's your deal or you could be getting off early at 5 a.m. And, and it's freezing cold and you need a ride. <laughs> um, so they also have like uh, posted routes again. So if you're looking for housing, maybe finding something on that route would be helpful as well. All right, we do have another question. Um, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is applying from a background of a different uh, Intent, a different area of study, um, a sculpture major looking to enter architecture or an art history major looking to enter landscape architecture or industrial design. And Haroon, I think this one's for you. Yeah, I think uh, the most relevant, like because we do portfolio reviews as well as students for people who are uh, applying, uh, I think what we look for is like the work that you have done and what you can bring to the uh, the community itself. Uh, as as an ID, we have uh, all different backgrounds in the studio. Like we have people from sculpture who have you know background in sculpture. They are in, in ID who have education, art history. I know like my classmates who have art history as their background, and in ID we have engineering, we have product design, and so it's it's more like what perspectives are you bringing to this. Uh, to the program. So that's what mostly uh, the program is looking for. Yep, and I'm gonna post a link to the um, the last portfolio review. We're completely booked for this Friday, but we're gonna have another one right before you're ready to submit your application. Um, so you're probably more primed and ready at that point anyways to show us what you're really gonna submit. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and post a link so you can sign up right now. They, they, they do get um, booked pretty quickly. So here's that. One second. But yeah, that that's that's really, really good advice because coming from a different major, it's not necessarily, I like to say this um, because we get this question a lot. It's not necessarily showing all of the skills that you have, but showing the tools that you have in your toolbox in terms of materials, right? The material experimentation. Um, in turn, like, is it relevant to what you want to do when you're here? But if you're just showing us, I've done photo, I've done printmaking, I've done sculpture, that is not relevant to what you want to do here. So you want to try to curate as much as possible and always know less is more. That's my spiel <laughs> on the portfolio. Um, and um, yeah, so that's a great example. 
And, and, you know, sometimes these applicants are the most interesting applicants because they bring so much more to the table, whether it be, you know, you're from a performance background or a literary background. Um, those are all really transferable things. Mechanical engineering, that's completely transferable, you know? And so I think um, I wouldn't sell yourself short. I would, you don't know where you're going to end up unless you apply. And that's sort of where I land with that. Um, Next question. Hello, everyone. As a student applying for MFA painting, I wonder how students live around campus and studio. Um, so maybe we can talk about how close you can live to your studio. Um, if you can live in your studio, which you cannot. Um, <laughs> um, so we can talk about that. Caroline, maybe what do students do? How, what, what is it different? Same? Um, well, I would say just overall, our graduate students are very busy, so you can expect a very rigorous course of study, a very full schedule. Um, most of our students, if they decide to work while they're studying, tend to work on campus jobs or graduate assistantships um, because those are jobs that are more flexible and accommodating for the graduate student schedule. Um, you know, classes, correct me if I'm wrong, begin around nine in the morning, maybe 10 and run until 4.30, 6.30, sometimes in the evening. Um, and, you know, yeah, the workload is is definitely rigorous. Um, we talked a little bit about housing and proximity, wanting to be on those bus lines or the, the RISD rides line, for sure, that would make your life a whole lot easier. Um, we've had students that have tried to, um, you know, commute to campus with a car, and that just adds another layer of complexity to finding parking or having a, you know, a parking pass somewhere or paying for, for parking on a daily basis. Um, so I would suggest avoiding that as much as possible. Um, and then when you're not in class, there's an enormous schedule of on-campus events. Um, the amount of artist lectures and talks that are happening every week. Um, you know, is enough to, to fill up an entire website of RISD events, literally, uh, where you can find something pretty much every day of the week, um, whether they're alumni talks, career center talks, um, visiting artists that are coming from different programs where those talks are open to the whole community. There's always something interesting going on. Um, we try to keep the events that are planned through graduate studies, we try to keep those very intentional because we know how busy graduate students are. So when we do try to bring uh, students together from all different programs, we try to make those events, um, you know, worth your time. Um, so we try to make them events where you have an opportunity to um, get to know folks in different programs, have some time to interact with them. Um, you know, at a social level, but also an academic level. Um, so we understand how busy you are and definitely try to um, cater to your schedule so that, you know, you can plug some of these other co-curricular and extracurricular things into your life. Um, and I would, oh, and I would also chime in about the studio culture for painting specifically. Painting shares a studio building with uh, four other uh, fine arts departments. And, you know, again, you can be in your studio whenever you want there. The studios now um, that things have really reopened up um, are 24 seven. So you have full access to your studio. Most people tend to be there, you know, on odd hours, late into the evening, on weekends. First year uh, painting students have a shared studio. Second year painting students have a large studio. As Molly said, you cannot live in your studio. There are walkthroughs that are done weekly that just um, by health and safety, you know, kind of check things out. But, you know, again, thinking about if you're going to be working late in your studio, you want to be able to get home um, I, somewhat quickly and safely as well. So whether that's um, as people have been saying, actually bus for that matter is kind of ruled out late at night. So you'd be thinking more of RISD rides or Ubers or, you know, maybe uh, shared rides with other people. I mean, I've had students, I mean, not to disagree with Caroline, because having a car is just a pain in the butt. But there are students that find it worthwhile. I mean, so for example, if you're working in furniture and you're, you have to somehow transport work or even in sculpture transport work from the CI from the Fletcher building where you have your work to the foundry that's across campus 
um, other than wheeling it across. <laughs> um, you know, some students do have cars and while parking is extremely limited, it's worth the extra cost to have a parking spot. And they just sort of include that in their overall budget. And so that's something to consider, you know, whatever, whatever it is that's gonna work for you, um, depending on the program that you're in, painting, um, you know, that might be one of those things too, is because painting is not just two dimensional. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we could talk about that for a while. Um, but I'll tell you what, I lived in Boston for two years and it's a lot easier here. No offense, Caroline. I know you live in Boston. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm in Connecticut. So yeah, no, I would not dare live in Boston. <laughs> not easy at all. Um, we I love also Boston. We do love Boston here. Yeah. I wouldn't want to have a car there though. No, uh, I, just, I just want to have a car there. Exactly. All right. Um, I did want to add a little bit about, about food and dining. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Speaking of kind of lifestyle and things like that, there are several options for dining on campus. And as a graduate student, you can purchase like a prepaid dining card or you can load up what's called a RISD Bucks card um, so that you have funds available to stop in any of the dining halls or cafeteria type places um, mm -hmm. as needed. And there are discounts, you know, available through doing it that way. And you can also pay cash. So there are places that are open and close to all the graduate studios so that you can, um, you know, fuel yourself through these long days. Um, and there's also obviously plenty of coffee shops and restaurants being a city full of colleges and universities, there's no shortage of good food. So yeah, and actually, there are several grocery stores that are walkable too, depending on what, what neighborhood you live in. Um, when I first moved here, I lived on the east side, and I could walk over to Whole Foods. Um, that's expensive. Uh, but there are other options, you know, I think that um, it just depends on your lifestyle. A lot of people will grow their own food, <laughs> you know, and so I think that, um, again, have it being a graduate student is one of the biggest important things that you can do is build yourself a budget, right? Figuring out the whole financial spectrum of this. And if you are admitted, we have a um, the student financial services office who cater to individual needs. Like they will meet with you and they will go with you through all of the things like, okay, I need parking. Where can I find housing? What's my budget for that? They're just absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, food is important too. There's also lots of Grubhub and really good food around here. So um, this is a good question. Speaking of SFS, which is also student financial services, um, what are what is the criteria for scholarships? So first I'm gonna say there's no criteria. Um, there's no like one thing we're looking for. We do not have a minimum GPA. Uh, we don't, do not require the GREs. Uh, it is based on merit and it is based on need. So unfortunately for most grad students, even if you did have a job, you don't have a job now. So need is kind of right around the same area. Um, but we do have a lot of options, Melanie. If you could throw into the chat just the, from the grad site that um, all the different kinds of of opportunities for domestic and international students because financial aid is available for both international and, and domestic students. Um, and those comes in the form of fellowships, which are larger amounts of money. Um, they're there to, sorry, I thought my phone was silent. Um, <laughs> they're there to uh, reduce the cost of tuition overall um, for you. And then there's assistantships. And, and again, those fellowships range based on the merit of uh, your, your entire application, based on your financial need, um, which is includes things like um, undergraduate debt, right? It includes things like how many people live in your household? Do you have children? Are you paying for spouses, um, uh, graduate studies maybe? So it includes a lot of different factors. And then there are assistantships, which are given out by Departments, and that's also a range of funds, but it typically is assigned to a job. Um, and those jobs are usually uh, based on teaching assistantships, research assistantships, things that are tied to what you want to learn how to do, right? So there's incentive there. That being said, you can also apply for assistantships across the school. 
Um, some are more competitive than others. And um, you can work up to 20 hours a week, but we don't want to go beyond that because your education is more important. Um, and then on top of that, we have the Society of Presidential Fellows, which is a full tuition um, scholarship and one brand new um, fellowship that is part of the Presidential Fellows um, that includes a stipend as well. Those are all very highly competitive and um, you would know whether or not you would receive fellowship, assistantship, presidential fellowship, all at the same time of being admitted. So and, all of happens at once. And to clarify for the presidential fellowship, you do not apply for it. It's not a separate application process. It's your graduate program would nominate you for it. So it's not, you don't need to do any extra work for that. For not any of them, the fellowship, the assistantship, you don't apply for any of that. You're admitted and you're automatically qualified for these things. So it's not an extra thing. The only caveat to that is that if you are a domestic student, you do need to fill out your FAFSA by February 1st, which is on our website. Um, and maybe Melanie can put in the FS, FSA.gov. I, I don't know. I don't do, I don't do acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> but it is free. It's a free, free federal application. Um, and that's just basically telling us how much undergraduate debt you have. And again, that goes to the, the need portion of those, these decisions. So that um, Molly, the yeah. institutional form too. Um, yeah. So something new this year, um, which will be communicated to you soon, um, is a institutional form for financial aid. Again, to help us understand the full scope of what your financial situation is. Do you have children? Do you have spouses um, that you're helping pay for? Um, anybody that you're supporting in your household? Um, it just, it runs the whole gamut of not just looking at your tax return for last year, because that does not tell the full story, right? And these things are used for us to be able to understand what's going to make it possible for you to financially afford risk day. That's it. Um, and um, you, you will get communication as long as you have completed your application, um, you will get communication about what that form is. That will be the next step. Um, all right, now that we've gone through all of our financial aid. <laughs> um, okay, next question. What is the day-to-day -day like for a typical student? What is the proximity to studio spaces and resources like kilns, workshops, dark rooms, et cetera? Um, and Haroon, I'm gonna put the spotlight on you for this one. Sure. Uh, for a day-to-day, -day, I would say classes usually start from the studio classes, especially that are like five hours long. They start from eight to one and the other session is 110 to 610. So if you have two studios in a day, I think your day is pretty much booked. <laughs> but usually classes, uh, they don't run all the way long, like five hours, but it's more like sometimes it's demos or a class or lecture. And then after that, it's more like work time. Uh, about the proximity, I would say most buildings have their own workshops. Like right now I'm in CIT building. Uh, we have a workshop in downstairs and we, each department has some sort of facility of making or like some kind of shops. But if you are looking for a specific workshop, like uh, the, if you mention Foundry, there is only one on campus. So you'll have to go there. Or if you're trying to look for work in the nature lab, then you'll have to go there. It's not that bad. It's like maybe hardly 10 minutes of walk from the farthest point. Like that is probably CIT. And then if you're walking to nature lab or there's the museum or something, I think it's hardly a 10 minute walk. It's not bad. Yeah. And um, Amy and Caroline, can you guys talk about how, uh, what the access is? Um, to these different spaces and how you might go about that. Um, knowing, for example, if I am a ceramic student, I have priority over the kilns, right? Versus someone just coming in and using it. It's dangerous. There's some safety going on. So can you guys just talk about that? Yeah, there's, um, you have access to your own um, shops that you know of the programs that you're in but to access other areas you do um 
need many of them you have to take some sort of um, kind of workshop thing to learn how to use the various equipment in the shop but you really have usually if you're not in the program you have to be in a class that would be in that shop you're not able to just kind of pop by uh, the ceramics department and do something with their facilities you would have to be in a class in order to have access to that there is um haroon mentioned there is a graduate wood shop and that's in the building it's called cit and fletcher these are two there's acronyms galore at RISD, RISD being an acronym. Um, and that's a grad shop that's open to any graduate student across the um, school. Again, you have to have attended some sort of uh, workshop to learn how to use the materials. You need to be in the shop when there's a monitor there. Um, people aren't allowed in spaces without someone else there. And that's, you know, for obvious safety reasons. Um, so, you know, there, and you can also book times. There's also the co-work space as well, where again, you know, it's more of a spot that you need to book time in. You need to have um, some sort of preliminary introduction to as well. And, and Amy, would you say that um, independent study programs are another way to, so let's say my undergraduate program was printmaking, but I'm painting, so I have that experience. Is there a way in which I'd be able to do an independent study program or gain sort of this special access to the space? Well, that would be purely, you know, a conversation with you and a faculty person from that department. So that could be something that you talk with your graduate program director about or your GPD, and they could make a connection to someone, say, in printmaking, who, you know, would have a conversation with you and you could sign up for an, um, an ISP, an independent study program, potentially. And I also think it does depend on... Uh, availability of space, right? Yeah. I mean, textiles, everybody wants to take a textiles class. We only have so many looms, right? And the majors get first dibs. So sometimes it's just a, a magical, like there happens to be a spot, um, but students find other ways about it too. CE classes, for example. Um, so um, Caroline, anything to add to that? Um, I'll just add some of the other resources like the Nature Lab. Um, Amy mentioned CoWorks, which is an interdisciplinary um, shop and curricular lab. Um, and then we also have, of course, the amazing Fleet Library. Um, those three um, opportunities offer um, work with us to offer webinars through the summer months so that you can get to know them ahead of time before you arrive to campus so that you can jump right in and start using them as soon as um, classes start. Um, another one is the Center for Arts and Language. I see we have a question here about peer tutoring and note taking. Um, the Center for Arts and Language provides um, communication instruction and support, whether that's written communication, um, verbal communication or you know presentations and things like that um they're great at providing not only peer tutoring but professional workshops and um lots of different ways yeah, to get and support. i'm going to put in some of the support services here as links um to um dss um and um, so, and then um, counseling, all of those different things that play a really huge role in why I think RISD has one of the highest retention rates, right? Like, so we're not just trying to throw you into the, <laughs> into the gauntlet. We're trying to support you through the entire process. And if that means that you need um, support through other offices, um, which we have, uh, we want to be able to thank you. Uh, Melanie, you beat me to it. Um, <laughs> we have people who will work with you through the entire length of your program. Um, the Center of Arts and Language is a huge one. And we're not just talking about people who English is not their first language. We're talking about any intersection of um, arts and language, which is a really big deal. <laughs> yeah. um, when you're thinking about making and researching um, to to culminate in a thesis, right? 
Yeah. So not to mention the incredible research librarians at Fleet Library. They're a huge resource when you're working on your written thesis. Um, they provide workshops as well as different seminars for program, different programs. We'll meet with them at different times throughout uh, the semester for written thesis support and research support. Um, and just to answer the second part of that question about peer tutoring and note takers, um, as far as note takers, that's something that you would connect with the DSS office, Disability Student Services. Um, and that works similar to if you had um, assistance at the undergraduate level where you would provide some documentation for your needs and they would work together with you uh, to make sure you have the accommodations that you need. Yeah, we already have um, an ASL interpreter hired for a portfolio review. So, you know, if you want support throughout this process as well, we're also here to help you with that. So, um, but I, I have always heard from DSS, the Disability Support Services, that they're not just here to help you as a student, but they're here to help you as a prospective student and then admitted student making that decision and then eventually in class. Oh, and I would also just like to add, I don't think we've mentioned it in detail yet, the RISD Museum as well as another, um, you know, really important resource. And the staff at the museum, the curators, the educators, and various people work with students in all different ways. Sometimes it might be a very formal um, partnership with a class, and, and it can be more informal things as far as your own uh, individual research and access to storage and items and pro in organizing different types of programming and all of that. So that's a really important um, aspect of, you know, somewhere where you can expand your research, whether it's working directly with objects, whether it's studying um, how various things are made and materials, and also working on different types of programming too, if you're interested in the educational aspect of it. Yep, absolutely. Um, Melanie, can you take the next question? I'm just answering one um, directly here. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to do the landscape architecture one, just FYI. Okay. All right. Um, so someone is asking about um, their portfolio review. Um, so um, this is more a question for Molly. Um, will it be a student um, who studies painting looking at a painting student or like, are they gonna match up to the program, um, the student who's getting reviewed? Student who is studying painting, looking at prospective ceramic student or is it tailored? Yeah, I mean, no, um, so it is kind of tailored. So essentially if you say, I'm torn between ceramics and painting, we'll put you with someone who has the experience within the fine arts division. That might be me, that might be someone like Melanie, um, and in that case, we would take a look at your work and we would potentially advise what program to apply for. Um, the difference being painting, the material can be a little open, right? Ceramics, not so much. You have to have interest in ceramic material, right? So um, if you come to a portfolio day, we'll be able to advise you uh, which program potentially to apply to, or we think that you'd be better suited for. But on your own, in the meantime, I would advise you to go to the to the um, RISD.edu, go to their academics page, look at the faculty bios, look at the student work, and see where you align, right? Um, because that's going to give you a lot of information about who do you want to work with and who do you want your professors to be, your connections even outside of RISD. Um, looking up some alumni, you know, there's just a lot more information. Um, that you can learn there as well. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, sorry, I'll, Melanie, I'll, I'm, I'll still, I'm still looking for oh, Haroon had something. I'll just add as like, uh, if you want to look up, you can also go to Digital Commons, which is like an open exhibition of all the work that uh, previous students have done. So mm -hmm. you can go into individual departments work. Like if you want to look on what ceramics department does, you can have a look there. All the thesis are there. You can go to Fleet Library website as well. I think you can access those too. So that that would be a good uh, resource for you to have a deeper look if you want to look into any specific department. Yeah, and I'm just sending out um, the question about parking in the Greater Providence area. 
Um, info.risd.edu um, has links to all of our offices and um, support um, systems in one location. And so I'm giving you the parking one. So uh, you can see what it is to just know what the parking enforcement is around here. You know, is it all meters? Is the, we have like up here in College Hill where we're, we are, you can park there for free after 10 a.m. Very inconvenient, but it's free. Work so, starts at 30. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And you have to learn the secrets because there's some places yeah, yeah, where yeah. like you can like, like, Get away with it. To the park because people are in and out. They don't check. So yeah. <laughs> things like that. Um, but yeah, and it just, really varies. just the parking employees. I don't feel like they work every day, you know? <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but um, all right. So we're coming to our last couple of questions here. So, and we have about 10 minutes left because we do have a session starting right at one o'clock. Um, so we're gonna end about five minutes early. So get your questions in. Um what happens if our financial situation significantly changes loss of outside income while we're enrolled? This is an excellent question. Amy, are you are you primed to answer this, Caroline? Because this is part of that um, sort of emergency student situation. Um, we basically just created it as a result of COVID. There were so many students that ended up in emergency situations. And so it's and I don't, I don't, I don't know entirely, but I do know that there is emergency funds, but there's criteria to that. Right. So I don't know the exact criteria, but what I do know is that the best course of action when that happens is first you reach out to our office, right? Um, usually there's a conversation that's been happening with your graduate program director. Um, they're usually aware of some of your struggles or, you know, things that you've been facing. Um, you fill us in on the situation and we connect you with student financial services. Um, they then decide to, and this is just generally how it's worked in the past, they then decide to set up a meeting with you um, to review a request for what's called emergency funding. Um, and they're I found them to be very responsive. Um, they understand that this is, you know, your livelihood and that you really likely do not have very many other options if you've come to this point um, and you're a full-time graduate student. Um, mm -hmm. So they re review that, that emergency funding request. And I believe there's a few ways that they go about it, um, whether that's, you know, a change to your um, financial package or is it a one-time, you know, extension of a loan or things like that. Um, but I've found that they've been able to, you know, come to conclusions and solutions for for everybody that has um, gone through that process. Yeah, and I think Caroline, this does um, this does uh, include both international and domestic students, knowing that there are clearly personal domestic issues going on, or but more importantly, there are huge issues going around the world um, economically, right? Um, ripple effects that are happening everywhere. So, so this is something that was created to help that. And again, it has to do with the retention. We don't want you to have to leave your program um, with all the effort put into getting your visa to get here, to study, um, to have to have that stop for that reason. And, and so we really do work hard to try to keep you guys safe and here um, and not live in, um, or live in an appropriate way, right? Um, and I would say that's that's another benefit of being in, you know, a smaller graduate community like RISD is that you have Amy and I here um, at your service, essentially. <laughs> we respond to emails quickly. It's not like sometimes at bigger schools where you send off an email and hope somebody will get back to you or return your phone call. We're here, we're responsive. Um, we make those connections happen for you. Um, and a lot of times, you know, there might be something that you're struggling with that we can solve that problem for you right away. You know, not yeah. just financially, but you've been having an ongoing problem. And, and if we know about it, we can help you find a solution. So we really, you know, weekly encourage graduate students to reach out with us with whether it seems like a small thing or it's a really big thing. If we, if we know about it, we'll, we'll help. 
and confidentiality. If you're, if you're having this issue or a question, there's a very good chance it's happened before and it will happen again. And, you know, we can um, help you address it. And I just want to say like confidentiality is is just an, a, a statement that's just known here. So you should know that we are your advocates and that you can come to us with anything, with no judgment. Um, and that's why we have a lot of the support services that we have. Uh, Melanie, did you wanna say something? Yeah, um, so I, I like to offer up this story as, a, as an example, um, just cause people may not necessarily feel comfortable talking about their own experiences, but um, as an undergraduate, this is probably a process that was 10 years ago, but um, being a dependent of my parents, um, my uh, dad had retired and it changed how my FAFSA was going to be. I think the FAFSA rules are also a little bit different because you can use a wider range of taxes and stuff like that. But when he did that, it changed the amount of financial aid I was receiving. And um, student financial services um, was super helpful. We got in touch with them and they found um, private funding in the amount of the difference of um, my new financial aid offer. So um, mm -hmm. very quick, it happened very quickly. Um, and yeah, I didn't really have to do much. It was really helpful. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent example. And that happens at the graduate level too. Um, I think we can sneak in the last question here. Um, the, how does the portfolio review session work? Our RISD portfolio review sessions are all online. And that way we can get to anybody who's willing to stay up all night from other places in the world um, <laughs> or we meet with domestic students on our own time zone. Um, but the reality is we're just, we're, we're allowing access to students um, to get their portfolio reviewed before they submit it because it can be as simple as you need a better photo of the work because the work is fantastic, right? It's as simple as that. Um, so I encourage everyone to get a portfolio review if you can. Um, we have this one December 9th, which we posted, um, but we also have a National Portfolio Day event, which will be happening later on in November. It's from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern time on a Sunday. So we might be in Struggle City, but you guys might be just waking up having a cup of coffee. So um, you can sign up for any one of those. They're all on our website. And of course, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to email us at admissions at RISD.edu. And uh, Caroline or Amy, if you guys want to put your office email, that way they can get in touch with you with any remaining questions. And just thank you guys so much for coming today. I hope this was helpful. It is recorded so that way you can see it again and pass it along to your friends. And that is all I got. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Amy. Everybody. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you, Haroon. I appreciate you so much. Thanks, Haroon. Bye. Bye.